Check, check, check. Okay, friends, gonna get started in a second. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Attack the Pantry. I'm Jen De La Vega. This stream is a deep dive into ingredients, cooking techniques, and recipes to help you cook for yourself during quarantine and, well, the rest of your adult life, right? 
Last time on Attack the Pantry, I talked for a very, very long time about food preservation, an unexpected amount of time about food preservation. So today we're continuing that with specifically pickling and cookies. Not together, but I don't know. Have you ever had like a pickle and cookie together? <laughs> That's what this show is about. We figure things out. <laughs> you can watch all the past clips on my channel here if you click on videos or the entire archive is located at youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V. And make sure to subscribe there because that's where the skate videos live. Um, on Sundays at 12 p.m. Eastern, I host a stream called Zine Dreams. And uh, this past week, we looked at Put an Egg on It issue 16, Food Fanzine by Mad Macax, and How to Disappear by Lily Carr. Um... I should talk a little bit about what being a Twitch affiliate is like. Uh, you get paid tiny amounts of money uh, for people that subscribe to your channels. That's how we keep things going here on Twitch. So uh, you can get subscriptions to your favorite creators uh, every month, and it sends them a little bit of money. Uh, to get around that, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can connect your account to Twitch, and it will give you a subscription uh, that you can distribute to a creator every month, which is very exciting. Um, it, it updates every month, so make sure that you re-up it uh, to support the people you like. Hopefully one of them is me, but of course there are hundreds and thousands of people on Twitch, so support creators on Twitch. It's great. It's nice. Uh, lots of really good links below the video here to support what I do, share uh, what I do on social, uh, links to my Etsy store, and all that. All fun stuff. This past week, whoa, lots of things happened. Um, had a skate video come out on Monday. I can't believe we're past 20 videos now. This is crazy. Um, this week I learned how to stop. I know that sounds crazy, but in the past I would just <laughs> jump off the board if I was going too fast and the board would just continue down the street without me, possibly rolling in the traffic. Um, so this week is all about stopping. So, <laughs> so you'll see me like going fast and then go stop. <laughs> it's a lot to learn, okay? <laughs> uh, so, Fun City slash Float City is on a break this week because the first Steel Fleet episode was over two hours long, so we felt like that was a lot, you know, of stuff to make. Um, and our very first live show is this Saturday, August 1st at 10 p.m. Eastern during Gen Con. That's G-E-N Con, not J-E-N-N -N Con. Uh, we will be playing Shadowrun, and uh, we've been practicing, uh, and I gotta say, the difference between Steel Fleet and Shadowrun is, like, not hard to switch between, but Shadowrun just has so many more uh, rules. <laughs> Good thing I learned on the hard mode first, right? <laughs> Uh, so to participate on Saturday, register for a free badge and add us to your schedule. Uh, so what is Gen Con? G-E-N Con. Uh, it's a tabletop role-playing conference with uh, live shows and opportunities to play tabletop RPG games with people from around the world. So it's lots of fun. There's so much to do. Uh, but hopefully you have time for us on Saturday night at 10 p.m. It will be lots of fun. This week on Patreon, I posted about my next Netflix party, which will be on August 6th. It's a Thursday. We're going to keep watching Ugly Delicious. Um, and I don't know what the next episode is, but we already saw Tacos. And I forget what the first one was. Do you remember what the first one was? Anyway, we're going to continue season one of Ugly Delicious. So uh, check out Patreon. It's... Uh, for our patrons only, so that's a small party. It's gonna be great. Uh, culinary episode, culinary word of the day. Um, episode three is up. Tang Zong. Uh, there's a recipe for corn snow cone and making your own personal buffalo wing sauce on Patreon. So that's real fun. Number four, episode four of Culinary Word of the Day is coming out tomorrow. Uh, you can follow the Twitter at CulinaryWOTD. I need help submitting words. Uh, I think I have had two submissions so far, so got lots of room in the, dic the, the culinary dictionary to expand here. Um, yeah, so check out the links below. Uh, let's just look at what y'all cooked this week. Oh, episode one was pizza. Thank you, Martin. Um, let's see what everybody cooked this week. 
So Martin, who's in the chat, had Korean barbecue. It's so exciting you did that at home. It was like pork belly, right? Yeah. Delicious, delicious. Um, Kate and Anthony sent me, well, I went over to their house and, uh, hung out on the stoop for a second and picked up a slice of blueberry cake, and, uh, later that evening they sent me a photo of their cat, Laika, <laughs> reaching for the blueberry cake. She's like, it's mine! <laughs> um, Vance sent along this picture of mac and cheese with hot dogs, and in our friend group chat, People were making fun of him, but then he responded, these hot dogs were locally made by the butcher up in Maine, like by my house. And I was like, oh, fancy hot dog mac and cheese. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I will never make fun of hot dog mac and cheese. Hot dogs are a vital uh, part of Filipino culture. Okay, what did I do this week? Let's see. Um... So I've been recipe testing for this cookbook and you get a lot of like leftover condiments, leftover things and I've just personally been eating all of these mashed up things together. So this is an English muffin with scrambled egg, uh, teriyaki beef and bitter melon, like salted bitter, lemon, bitter melon. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm starting to appreciate, like, the note of bitterness in, in food. I've never really been a fan, but uh, adding salted bitter melon to things has been, like, enlightening. Like, I'm just chewing it and, like, thinking like this. I'm not sure I like it. Maybe I do like it. <laughs> it's kind of how I've been all week. Ridiculous, Jen. Um, what else? Oh, okay, so this is a sideways view of... <laughs> so, last week, when we talked about Asian supermarkets, people were sharing um, their suggestions of what to buy. Andy Bio, who goes by the handle Wax Pancake, um, suggested these um, bubble tea popsicles They've got, like, um, molasses and uh, tapioca balls in the middle with, like, a custard filling, like, custard base. I was in Chinatown shopping for work, and uh, I saw these in the freezer case, and I was like, it is 90 degrees. Can I make it home with these intact? And the answer is no. <laughs> I ate one outside of the store just to like have it like as it was meant to be and it didn't look like this. It looked prettier, I swear. Um, but when I got home, I could feel how soft they were in the packages and so I stuffed them in the freezer and unfortunately this is what it looks like uh, after a second refreeze. It was like a little icy but still good. Um, but once I tried it, I felt like maybe I could make it. Like if I used the um, New York Times custard based recipe. Uh, I have like mini tapioca and lots of molasses, so maybe maybe I can figure this out. Maybe. Don't know. Uh, for dinner the other night, um, well, because I have to test so many recipes, one of them required fresh ramen noodles, and I only needed half, and so the other half I could eat as directed. So Sun Noodle, which is a New Jersey-based um, noodle company here in New York, uh, in the tri-state area, um, they supply to most of the ramen restaurants in New York City. Uh, so if you love the ramen noodles at um, Ipudo or Momofuku, Sun Noodle is the company that makes them. And so at Hong Kong Supermarket, Sun Noodle sells um, fresh ramen packs with their own like tonkatsu paste that you mix with hot water. It was super fast and way better than the dry like cup of noodle. So, on top of my ramen, I have a cured egg yolk, crispy garlic, some of that bitter melon I was talking about, and uh, some mackerel sushi that I will show you more in detail next. But um, this was so good. This was, like, incredibly good. So if you go to any uh, Chinatown shops um, and spot the sun noodle ramen uh, ready-to-eat stuff, uh, I highly recommend the tonkatsu uh, mix. 
Like it was cloudy and umami and delicious and very rich. Uh, I really, really liked it. What else? Oh, here's the sushi that I was talking about. Um, one of the recipes I had to test this week was uh, mackerel fish balls. And so that left me with half a pound of mackerel. And I was like, okay, how do I make mackerel last all week? Uh, so I made shime, sh shime saba, which is marinated uh, mackerel sushi. So you salt it uh, for half a day, rinse it, and then soak it in rice vinegar until it, um, you know, until you want to use it. So I made uh, lots of mackerel sushi, and I have a mole salt that I was dipping it into instead of soy sauce because I have lots of salt in my house. Um, but this was fun. Uh, made uh, mackerel maki. <laughs> Cute, right? Very cute. I do love Saba. It's one of my favorites. A really fun bite that I had this week was frozen green mango with shrimp salt. Um, I've been mailing salts uh, from my Etsy store, and uh, my friend Tu Tran actually returned a salt to me. Like she made salt herself and mailed some to me, and so this is a shrimp salt that she is working on. It's got like dehydrated carrot and uh, dried shrimp. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> and it was really good on mango. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a really fun thing uh, that we did with the podcast last week, excuse me. Ah, uh, we hit 200 patrons on Patreon at Fun City. And so as a surprise, the night before we thought we were going to hit it, and we did hit it the next day, um, we came up with 200 Shadowrun nicknames. Like, if you were in a futuristic gang, you know, what would your nickname be? And we randomly assigned them to people. Uh, and Mike made all these great graphics, and so people were so surprised, and we messaged them individually to all 200 backers and um in return like we weren't expecting this or you know we didn't ask but uh, a few of the patrons suggested names for the cast and uh it was mike swears up and down that it was randomly generated or randomly assigned but i got the griddle <laughs> which is sick and appropriate like i was really really stoked about it but yes, you may call me the griddle from now on. <laughs> okay. Let's... How are we? How are we in the chat? Yeah, aka the griddle. Martin, how is it in the Bay Area? Are you standing at your desk or are you sitting now? Or are you watching me on TV? Let me get to... Nope. Sorry. There we are. Back to my big head. You're on a MacBook. Nice. You're sitting. Glad you could rest. You gotta pick up your CSA today too, huh? Wonderful day. Wednesday's a good day. It's pretty nice there. Not too hot. Good, good, good. Okay. Let's get into pickling. Lucius isn't here, who's the one that asked, but hopefully, Lucius, you'll catch up in the future on the archive stream. So I'm going to say hello to you as you are watching future stream. Hello, Lucius. <laughs> um, so continuing from our conversation about preserving food, um, I believe philosophically that you can pickle that. You can pickle pretty much anything. The most common you'll see will be cucumber, but uh, after that, you'll see lots of veggies that you can pickle, fruit, and did you know you could pickle meats and seafood as well? Yes, it's true. You can pickle all of these things. Essentially, the steps to pickling are um, sanitizing your work equipment. So sanitizing the jars, that means boiling them in a pot of water for like an hour or as little as 10 minutes for up to an hour, uh, sanitizing the rings and the lids of the jar. Um, I do not recommend using swing top jars for pickling because uh, sometimes the seal is not perfect. Um, yeah. And if you have a dishwasher, you can. Uh, some of them have like a sanitizing mode. 
I wouldn't just say that using a regular dishwasher mode will be hot enough to sanitize, um, but some dishwashers have a sani sanitization like button. So feel free to use that if you have it. Um, but essentially, so you sanitize your stuff, you're gonna cut whatever you're pickling into uniform shapes. Why do we cut into uniform shapes? It's so that they pickle evenly. It's sort of similarly to uh, in French cooking, why do we, why are they so exact about measurement and shape? It's because if you were going to saute like a bunch of cubed carrots, they're all gonna cook at the same rate. So like a carrot, a whole carrot is not gonna cook at the same rate as like a chopped carrot. So same thing goes for pickling. So if you're going to do cucumbers, common shapes are either whole, half, quarter spears, or in chips. Um, so the more surface area you expose, the faster it will pickle. So a whole cucumber versus a baton, whole cucumber is going to take longer. A baton versus, I mean a baton or a spear versus chips, the, the spear is going to take longer. Chips versus like a mashed up minced relish, chips are going to take longer to pickle. Get it? Um, next, you would add your aromatics, which are most commonly garlic, dill, pepper, salt, um, sometimes sugar. Uh, it depends on what you like. You, you can play around with aromatics. I would say aromatics is where you can improv the most with pickling, but I wouldn't really play with the proportion of brine. Um, I mentioned last week that it's really tough to... Um, improvise with food preservation because you want to maintain a pH of 4.6 or below. If you mess with like the water and the salt level, then you can't guarantee what the pH is going to be, especially um, if you don't have any pH strips at home or you're, you know, you got to like use tested recipes for that. Um, and when in doubt, you can visit the National Center for Home Preservation website and they have um, recipes and advice for every single thing that I've been talking about. Um, so after you've added your aromatics, oh wait, so, so pickling, you can experiment with the aromatics. Like an unconventional combination that I really like is cinnamon and rosemary for cherries. So you can do sweet pickles. Yeah, um, a book that I that really helped me uh, figure out those funky combos is the Flavor Bible. Um, I highly, highly recommend that book. You can always just like look through it and be like, I wonder if this goes with this, and it will tell you. Uh, after you've gotten your aromatics into the jar, the next thing is like waiting, like sealing it up and waiting. Oh, the waiting. Uh, quick pickles can be done in an hour, but the secret to that is that the pickles are cut very, very small and they te tend to have a stronger brine. Uh, they're not meant to be kept. So quick pickles, if you're going to do like something for tacos, like pickled onion that day, um, they can be done really quickly, but um, the brine will be so strong the next day it might you know, be a little too much. Um, so I would probably dilute that if you were to keep quick pickles more than a day. Uh, canned preserved pickles can last up to a year if you do pressure canning. Wow. So going to the very beginning of things, pickling likely first originated in the Indus Valley civil Civilization in Northwest India around 2400 BC, y'all. Wow. The New York Food Museum's Pickle History section points out the archaeological evidence of cucumbers native to India being pickled and exported to Digris Valley of Iraq in 2030 BC. Yo. Indian pickles are mostly prepared in three ways. Salt and brine, oils and vinegars, and, um, oh, sorry, that's three things. Salt, brines, oil, and vinegars, excuse me, uh, with mango pickle being the most popular of them all. Fascinating. To review, pickling was used as a way to preserve food that is out of season, uh, preserve food for out of season use and for long journeys, especially by sea. And I wrote an essay about this. You can look for it uh, at Taste Cooking. Um, I trace the history of achara, which is a green papaya pickle in the Philippines, and the origin is India. Like. Uh, boat trips from India, preserved pickles, and then they 
uh, taught that technique to Filipinos, and now we have something called achara, which is very, very close to achar, which is Indian pickle. So talking about boats, salt pork and salt beef were common staples for sailors before, you know, we had steam engines and, and uh, you know, introducing galley kitchens onto ships. Um, so the process was amended to preserve foods. Pickles are also made and eaten because people love them. They are so good, right? What's your favorite kind of pickle? God, I love a new pickle and a half sour. I don't really like full sours. Um, pickling may also improve the nutritional value of food. Excuse me, I might sneeze. Oh, my. <laughs> okay, maybe I won't sneeze. <laughs> I lost it. I lost it. Um, so pickling introduces B vitamins produced by the bacteria, the friendly bacteria that we have in the jar. So pickles originated in India where it's called a char, like I said. The English term pickle comes from the Dutch word peckle, which refers to the brine itself. Oh, gosh, don't you hate it when you lose a sneeze? Uh, in Hobson Jobson's Definitive Glossary of British India, it says that the Indian word achar was also mentioned in a 1563 cookbook authored by a Portuguese physician, Garcia de Horta, who mentions Indians of the Portuguese Indian colony of Goa preserving cashews with salt. And that was also called achar. Very interesting. Uh, Indian food scientist K.T. Achaya explains in a historical dictionary of Indian food that pickling is cooking without fire. I kind of like that definition, even though I love fire. You know what I mean. Uh, so many varieties of pickled and fermented foods are classified by the ingredient and the method of preparation. So regular dill pickles and sauerkraut are fermented and cured for about three weeks-ish. Refrigerator dills are fermented for about one week. Yes. During curing, colors and flavors change, the, ex the acidity increases. Um, fresh pack or quick processed pickles or quick pickles are not fermented. Uh, some are brined for just several hours or overnight and then drained and covered with vinegar and seasonings. So you would take either some chopped hot chilies or some onions, toss them in some salt, uh, cover it with a, a, like a kitchen towel and leave that on your counter for a day. You'd rinse that and then add vinegar the next day. So it would have like a little bit of fermented funk, like a little little bit, but it's not truly, truly fermented, you know? Um, so fruit pickles are usually prepared by heating the fruit in a seasoned syrup acidified with either lemon or vinegar or sometimes citric acid. Excuse me. Oh my gosh. Um, relishes are chopped fruits and vegetables, not together, um, chopped fruits and or vegetables uh, that are cooked with uh, seasonings and vinegar. Um, when you're dealing with cucumber, remember to discard like that slice of the blossom end um, because that blossom contains an enzyme that causes um, excessive rotting or softening of pickles and that's how some pickles get ruined. If you ever had a mushy pickle, the reason may have been that they didn't cut off enough of that blossom end. So like I said earlier, caution, the level of acidity in a pickled product is as important to its safety as it is to taste and texture. Do not alter vinegar, food or water proportions in a recipe that's been tested or don't use vinegars that have unknown acidi acidity. So if you're home making vinegar, I would suggest that you get pH strips to make sure that the pickles you make with homemade vinegar are below that pH of 4.6. Um, yeah. So the reason for that is there must be a minimum uniform level of acid throughout the mixed product to prevent the growth of botulism. Botulism is that really scary uh, uh, death-inducing bacteria that you can get from canned products. Um, that you'll find them in uh, cans that have been dented. This is why you don't really buy uh, cans that have been dented because if you dent a can, some of that metal uh, may go into the mix and react with the acid in there, creating um, like sort of gas and explosion. So that's why you'll see bloated cans. You should never buy those. Don't buy any cans that are dented really hard. Um, yeah, botulism is dangerous, y'all. Um, yeah. So, 
talking about suitable containers and safety, more safety. It's really important to be safe with pickling because you could really food poison yourself. I'm sorry if I keep re-emphasizing that. Um, but you'll need uh, big gallon containers if you're going to do like five pounds of fresh vegetables. But if you're just um, doing jars at a time, then a pint is great. Quart jars are great. Uh, you can buy them by the case from Ball or Weck. Um, what else? Food grade plastic and glass containers are also great substitutes. Um, stone crocks, if you're going to do um, sauerkraut, is really fun. I use my stone crocks for um, nukazuke, which is a Japanese uh, style of pickling. And uh, for uh, storing my utensils. <laughs> when I'm not pickling with them. Um, so be certain, like, just be certain that foods uh, contact only food grade plastics. Don't use garbage bags or trash liners because sometimes they'll have um, like perfumes or like air fresheners on the liner or like, uh, like bleachy stuff. So don't use, don't use trash bags. You also uh, can't predict like how safe it is like you could pierce it very easily and then the brine will go everywhere it's not fun uh <laughs> but yeah uh what else what else safety stuff cabbage and cucumbers must be kept one to two inches under brine while fermenting which is why you will see items like pickle weights in the store or if you start buying like pickling material um pickle weights or things that you can get to make sure food stays under the brine but you know the cheap way is to use a zipper bag and uh fill it with water and then just put it on top of the food that is still enough weight so that's that's the way i get around it um or you could use like a small plate that fits the circumference of whatever it is like it must not sit on the lip of the crock it should be inside and weighing down the food that's the point of it um, it's not enough to just cover, like, plastic wrap. Like, you don't want that. Uh, what else? Uh, you can also cover the container with a clean, heavy bath towel to prevent um, fruit flies and molds while the vegetables are fermenting. Uh, I do a kitchen towel that's folded in half twice and then a really big rubber band around the the end of a mason jar. I, I don't... Yeah, I'm making some vinegar right now, but I don't want to bring it down from on top of the fridge. <laughs> it's heavy. Uh, so let's talk about types of pickles. So you like a garlic pickle. Mm, I am haunted by a sneeze ghost. My nose is a little stuffy right now. Why are cucumbers the most popular pickle? I'm not actually sure. I think it's because that was the first kind of pickle in India. And um, it was just taken around the world, preserved, and all these cultures picked it up. I think it's also because they just easily grow, you know, anywhere. <laughs> and uh, I think we have the most uses for it in American cuisine. So, you know, eating pickles by themselves, having it on a sandwich, having it on a burger. Um, one of my favorite pickle dishes that I've discovered is sopa orgokawa, which is a Polish pickle soup. Delicious, like pickles and bacon are great together. Ooh, I should have like a, a bacon and pickle sandwich. That sounds dope. Yum. Uh, but types of pickles, uh, so quick, or fridge or brine pickles are meant to be consumed soon and they're usually produced without vinegar. Um, they're usually salted. Uh, bread and butter pickles have more sugar content in them. Gherkins are tiny cucumbers. Some of them have bumps. In France, you might know them as a cornichon and they are served with a charcuterie and pickled onion. Uh, kosher dills, which are really, really popular in New York City, those are garlic and dill that are added to the salt brine. In New York terminology, full sour kosher dill is one that has been fully fermented, while a half sour is given a shorter stay in the brine, and it's still kind of crisp and bright green. 
Um, elsewhere, these pickles may sometimes be called old and new dills. So like an old dill is a full sour and a new dill is a half sour. Um, lacto-fermentation or natural fermentation is at room temperature. Um, it, it bolsters the growth of lactic acid bacteria and produces that required acidity for pickles to be safe. Um, it is naturally for, present on the skin of cucumbers or whatever you're pickling. So, uh, like I said earlier, if you did chilies, you'd put some salt in it and leave it on the counter for a day. That is lacto-fermentation. And then you can add your vinegar uh, to make whatever it is that you're making. Uh, there are pickle mixes, which is really exciting. Um, so it's not just limited to um, just one singular thing, like all, all cucumber or all blueberry or all strawberry. Um, there's Italian giardinara, which is a mix of onion, carrot, celery, and cauliflower. How many of you have had that? Like on an antipasto plate? <laughs> Yeah. Or there's chow chow, which is a tart vegetable mix popular in the maritime provinces and the southern United States. Um, there is encurtido or curtido, which is uh, in Latin America. It's like an appetizer or as a tapa in Spain. Uh, in Central American com uh, countries, it is cabbage, onion, carrot, lemon, vinegar, oregano, and salt. That sounds delicious. In Mexico, um, this their version has carrot, onion, jalapeno, pepper. You might have seen that uh, in to-go containers at your uh, local taqueria. And that's also known as escabeche or escabeche. Escabeche or escabeche. Depends on who you're talking to, dialect-wise. In Hungary, we have salamade, which is a type of mixed pickle made of cabbage, cucumber, paprika, onion, carrot, tomatoes, and bay leaf mixed with vinegar. It sounds delicious. Um, mentioned a lot already, we have achar, which is the Indian pickle, mango pickle. They also have something called mixed pickle, which is like lime rind and like various vegetables. The, the unique thing about this type of pickling is there's a step for oil tempering. So way, way back when we were talking about herbs and seed, like seed spices, um, the reason why there's oil tempering is that uh, there is an oil located in every like seed spice. So like coriander, peppercorn, they have like a little bit of oil on the inside of them. And so when you freshly crack them, you're releasing that oil. And um, so in Indian oil tempering, you are taking these whole spices like cumin, pepper, coriander, and unlocking that oil inside and it's soluble in vegetable oil. And so after you've um, prepared your pickle, you add this last step of like an oil layer to distribute the spice flavors, which is so cool. I'm currently curing calamansi rinds this way. Actually, let me go get it. I wanna show it to you. So I'll be right back. So this is my calamansi rind achar. It's been sitting in my window for like a couple weeks. I think it needs to be in the window for like a month to get to the right acidity and then I'll transfer it to the fridge. So every day I have to like swirl it and then flip it. So I've been flipping it upside down. It's pretty cool. Very excited. So I save my citrus rinds for that purpose to like pickle them. Uh, what else? Um, I mentioned the achara in the Philippines. I have a recipe on taste cooking that you can check out. Um, that's green papaya with carrot and chili. And it's really good with barbecue, gotta say. We have kimchi from South Korea. All kinds of kimchis. Um, there is this great, um, article in the New York Times by... Kimchi is a verb. Uh, think of kimchi as a verb by Eric Kim. 
so it's not just cabbage anymore. You can kimchi pretty much anything. Like I, I think you can pickle anything, so you can kimchi anything, which is very exciting. Uh, in the Middle East, we have torshi. That's the name of the pickles there. Um, has anyone ever tried Kool-Aid pickles? I found it on the Wikipedia page, and it scares me because I don't really like sweet, sweet pickles. I've pickled fruit, but like, I've never really added too much sugar, you know? It's like pickled strawberries kind of sing on their own, you know? What is everybody's favorite pickles? I know that you like a garlic, a garlic pickle, Martin. What about everyone else? Choo, 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 choo. I know, I know, Kool-Aid pickle. I don't understand. Uh, let's see, let's look at some pickles. Oh yeah. Got some pickles here, that's a pickle jalapenos. Oh, these are some common pickle problems. So if you see a spotted, dull, or faded color, um, the cucumbers were not well cured, or excessive exposure to light. Um, pickles should be stored in a cool, dark place, like in a cabinet or on a shelf away from a window. Or the cucumbers were on their way out, like they were already sort of rotting. Um, so be careful, only use like fresh, fresh material when you're pickling. Uh, if you start seeing white sediment in the jar that you had not put in yourself, that means um, the bacteria is eating a lot. Uh, or the salt contains an anti-caking agent or other additives. Um, so don't use that brand of salt if it is uh, leaving stuff at the bottom of the jar. Um, yeah. Whoa. What else? So pickle problems number two. Hollow pickles. The cucumbers were too large for brining. Use smaller cucumbers or cut them smaller. Uh, hollow pickles, improper fermentation. Keep the brine at a proper strength and keep the product well covered. Interesting. Um, that means that the bacteria or uh, the cucumber was rotting from the inside because the seed part is the softest part and so it's, uh, you know, the weakest part of the vegetable. <laughs> um... Let's see, shriveled pickles, let's see. Let me move this up a little bit. Placing cucumbers in too strong of a brine, too heavy syrup, or too strong vinegar. Interesting. Uh, did you ever do that science experiment when you were younger of an egg in uh, soaked in water and then soaked in vinegar and then soaked in sugar water? In the vinegar, the egg uh, became shriveled. It's a hypertonic solution. You remember that? Um, in the sugar solution, the egg became bloated. It's a hypotonic solution. And then in the water, it remained at equilibrium. So shriveled pickles means that the brine was too strong or it was a, too hypertonic. Exciting. Glad I can use my high school science here. Scum on the brine surfaces while curing cucumbers. Wild yeasts and bacteria that feed on the acid, thus reducing the concentration if allowed to accumulate. Uh, if you start seeing scum at the top of any of your pickles, remove it as often as you can. As soon as you see it, remove it with a spoon. Um, dark or discolored pickles. That means you have hard water. Interesting. Or you have, uh, you've been using ground spices, which can discolor, you know, everything. Um, Plus, ground spices tend to taste a little more stale than using whole spices. Um, it's kind of like steeping tea. Like, if you break the bag, all that stuff's going to get everywhere. Like, using whole spices is, I don't know, mellower. Unless you really, really want, like, the strong, strong spices. Pickle problems number three. Let's see. Soft or slippery pickles. Oh, boy. Um, that means the salt, the salt brine was too weak during fermentation. Um, or you didn't process it properly, like you um, left that blossom end that you should have uh, cut off. Or you didn't wash them well enough. Uh, or there's just not enough brine, the pickles were not underneath that brine line in the jar. Or you had moldy garlic. Ooh. Let's see, strong, bitter taste. Spices were cooked too long in the vinegar, or too many spices were used, or your vinegar was too strong, or dry weather. Can't stop that. <laughs> That's really funny, dry weather is there. But yeah, those are common pickle problems. 
Um, shoot, there's a pickle book that I want to show you. I'll be right back again. I'm really sorry. I didn't get my book. I should have just... One second. One second. I'm going to get the pickle book. Okay, so I have this book, Asian Pickles by Karen Solomon. I refer to it all the time because they are not traditional pickle recipes, which is so cool. Um, let me just see some of the ones that I've flagged here. Uh, cucumber arame pickles from Japan. These are cucumber soy sauce uh, arame, which is, what is it? It brings a nice briny flavor and complimentary color texture to the pickles. Oh, it's seaweed. Um, and black sesame oil. Another one that I have here is pickled garlic from Korea. Uh, manul changachi. Manul changachi. Uh, da -da -da. Hot carrot pickle is one that I use a lot. This is an Indian recipe. It's carrots, jalapeno, vinegar, asafoetida, which is... Um, a spice, like it's called hing powder in Indian cuisine. You only use like a pinch of it. Salt, chili powder, mustard oil, um, vegetable oil, fenugreek seed, and dried chili flake. Fun, that sounds so good. Uh, cucumber and shallot pickle. Sweet pickled garlic. This is from, this is from Southeast Asia. Uh, kratiam, kratiam dong. Garlic, sugar, salt, water, and vinegar. Really easy. Thai pickled cabbage. Yum, yum, yum. Hot pickled pineapple and peanut. Interesting. Uh, do I have any other marked here? Yes, I do. Preserved seaweed. Delicious. I've done that with turnip before. Pickled ginger. So you can make your own pickled ginger at home instead of, you know, getting it from the Japanese store. Exciting. But yes, highly recommend this book, Asian Pickles by Karen Solomon. Let's move on to another subject. If you're ever unsure about pickling or home preservation, um, visit the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Uh, they have so much information on their website, plus recipes and advice for writing recipes and what is safe, what is not safe. They are great. Thank you. Let's put an egg on me. Hard boiled egg. Let's put a fried egg also. Hello, fried egg. Next, we're going to talk about cookies. Yama cookies. So what is a dang cookie? What is your favorite cookie, by the way, Martin? I really like um, that brand Tate's because they're like real um, crispy and they soak up a lot of milk. I like the chocolate chip and the butterscotch chip one. Um, I like Speculoos, like those um, molasses crinkles. Those are my molasses crinkles are my favorite. I told this story before, but in high school, my best friend Rachel knew that I love these cookies, and for my birthday. At the beginning of, of the school day, she gave me five dozen molasses crinkles. And over the course of the day, I gave away and or ate all of them. They were gone. Five dozen cookies were gone over the course of a day. I can eat that many molasses crinkles. You grew up on Chips Ahoy. I also had a few of those growing up, but I thought they were kind of dry. Um, but the same could be said for the Tate's cookies, so I really have no excuse. Um, but basically, cookies are baked, typically flat, typically, keyword typically flat, small and sweet. Uh, are there any exceptions to these rules, these, these four tenets, like baked, flat, small, sweet? Yes, of course there are exceptions to all of these things. Um, can cookies be fried? Have you ever had a fried cookie? Would you consider a small churro to be a fried cookie or a pastry? No. Can they be steamed? 
I don't think so. Have you ever heard of a steamed cookie? I'd be open-minded. I want to see a steamed cookie. Uh, can cookies be boiled? Not really. Um, can they be raw? Yes. Cookies can be raw, actually. The exceptions to flat, uh, we've got Mexican wedding cookies, which are in ball shape, rum balls, macaroons, which look like haystacks. The exception to small are, you know, obviously big ass cookies. Have <laughs> you ever had a big ass cookie? I have. I've had one as big as my face. Um, I'm not gonna show you that, but I do have a picture of some cookies. Chocolate chip, look at those. Those kind of look like Chips Ahoy, don't they? I think so. Mall birthday cookie, yes, the giant, giant uh, cookie. At some, I, I don't remember what restaurant it is, but there's a restaurant that does a pizuki, which is a pizza cookie, which is as big as a pizza pan. Um, you like pure oatmeal and chocolate chip, yes, yes. I like oatmeal without the raisin. I also like an oat, an iced oatmeal, like the really crunchy iced oatmeal ones, or um, oatmeal cream pies also. Is a moon pie a cookie or is it a pie? Yeah, down with raisins. I also don't like raisins. Anyway, um, are there any exceptions to sweet? Are there cookies that are not sweet? I think that's sort of the deal breaker, right? Like that defines a cookie, it must be sweet. All the others, I feel like, doesn't necessarily have to be baked, it can be raw, it doesn't necessarily have to be flat, um, it doesn't have to be small, but I think it has to, has to, has to be sweet. Um, so the common components of a cookie are flour, sugar, and some type of oil or fat. In the UK, they're called biscuits. You ever see that video of Cookie Monster visiting his cousin named Biscuit Monster? Or him talking to, um, what's his name? Uh, John Oliver, like, wait, there are no cookies in the UK? Oh, no, no, they're just called biscuits. <laughs> very cute. It's a very good video. Um, so the word cookie dates from 1730 in Scottish usage, Scotland, Scotland usage. Um, the word means plain bun rather than a baked good. So it's not certain whether it is really the same word, but that's kind of what is agreed upon. In the, uh, from 1808, the word cookie is attested in the sense of a small, flat, sweet cake in American English. Um, the American use is derived from Dutch kowikje, which means a uh, little cake. <laughs> little cake. I'd like, I think that's a lovely little nickname for someone. Hello, little cake. Um, another claim is that the American name cookie derives from... Uh, oh, sorry, it's the same sentence. Sorry. Um, it may have proliferated because there was a huge Dutch settlement in New York City. So that's possibly where the word cookie became popularized. Uh, Cookie-like hard wafers have existed for as long as baking has been documented, in part because they deal with travel very well. Like, think of Lord of the Rings, Lembus bread. It's not necessarily a cookie, but it was so dry and dense that it traveled really well. Um, in the beginning, they were not really sweet enough to be considered cookie by modern standards. Um, but they appear to have their origins in 17th and 7th century AD Persia, shortly after the use of sugar became relatively common in that area. They spread to Europe through the Muslim conquest of Spain, and by the 14th century, they were common in all levels of society throughout Europe, from royal cuisine to street vendors. Hooray for cookies! <laughs> So, with global travel becoming widespread at that time, cookies made a natural travel companion, just like Lembus Red and Lord of the Rings. Uh, and one of the most popular early cookies um, was known as the Jumble. It's a relatively hard cookie made from nuts, sweetener, and water. A Jumble. Uh, cookies came to America through the Dutch in New Amsterdam in the late 1620s, like I said, New York area. Um, num num num. Oh my, the earliest reference to cookies in America is in 1703 when, quote, the Dutch in New York provided in 1703 at a funeral 800 cookies. Wow. Wow. The most common cookie, the co most common modern cookie, uh, given its 
uh, given its style by creaming butter and sugar, was not common until the 18th century, like the Toll House recipe. That is signature, creaming butter and sugar together. Um, and so that word, creaming butter and sugar, uh, a lot of cookie recipes will start that way because the butter and sugar um, really... The butter is like a vehicle for the sugar to be distributed evenly throughout the cookie. That is why you need to whip it together. And it also uh, determines the texture of the cookie, like crisp or, um, or soft or chewy. And uh, that's why you deal with softened butter and not melted butter. Because if it doesn't have that structure, it's just going to like pool everywhere. And that's probably why you get the Tate's cookie, which is um, super thin and crispy. Yeah. Let's see. What else? So what kinds of cookies are there? So the traditional cookie that we know now, like in the in the 2020s, dropped cookies. Those are your chocolate chips, your oatmeal raisin, your snickerdoodle, your peanut butter. Um, they could be easily, like with a teaspoon, dropped onto... That's why they're called dropped cookies, because you scoop them and drop them. Uh, for more Instagram-friendly cookies, uh, you'll see people using ice cream scoops. Um, they are consistently measured. That's kind of the plus side of using an ice cream scoop. Um, you can also do like a canal, which is using two tablespoons to uh, scoop one and then using the two tablespoons to shape it into a nice ball. Um, so those are dropped cookies. Um, they can be filled like hamatashin. They can be chewy, they can be soft, they can be sandwich, which is really fun. We got Oreos and oatmeal cream pies from that. Um, in, in the UK, it's a little more popular there to do bars or what they call tray bakes, uh, where there's a shortbread layer baked under a fruit filling or a chocolate filling. We've also got uh, pressed cookies. Um, it's spritzgebak. Spritzgebak. Yeah, spritzgebak. It's a type of German and Alsatian Mosalen Christmas biscuit or Christmas cookie made of flour, butter, sugar, and eggs. Um, and they end up crisp and fragile, dry and buttery. But you load up the dough into this, like, it looks like a caulking gun. And it has um, flat metal discs that you can interchange in the front of it. And so you put the, the gun down onto the, onto the baking sheet and you pull the trigger and it will extrude the dough. And then, uh, you know, you can move it. So I, I grew up doing that, actually. My family is not German, obviously, but uh, my mom bought that gadget from Macy's one time, and we just every Christmas we had been making pressed cookies. Um, that reminds me, I didn't mention it earlier, but um, are pizzelles considered cookies? Yes, pizzelles are waffle cookies. That's an Italian uh, version of, of uh, like, like a tiny, a thin as heck waffle. I love pizzelles very very good um another pressed cookie in the philippines is called polveron which is rice flour and sugar pressed together it's very very dry polvo is powder so uh, it's pressed powder that um you can like eat in one bite and then it like with it has milk powder in it and so it kind of becomes like a cookie dough texture in your mouth with your saliva um or like when i was little i would break it up uh with a spoon and like eat it and put Rice Krispies in it. Yum. We have rolled cookies. So um, you make a cookie dough, freeze it, and slice it. Um, this is with crisps or shortbreads. Um, this also uh, includes the category of like fortune cookies, wafers, digestives. Uh, we have dipped cookies, you know, co dipping cookies in chocolate and then letting it cool. Um, there's alfajores, which are some of my favorites. Alfajores are delicious. We've got meringue, which is a whipped egg white, um, and that is where you get maca macaron. So there's a huge difference between macaroon with two O's and macaron, which is the meringue one with a jelly filling. So macaroon is coconut pile with maybe some dipped chocolate on the bottom. Macaron is the French meringue cookie that's two halves with a little filling. We also have no-bake cookies, so those are peanut butter-based cookies that um, mix in nuts and then are tossed in like a, a powdered sugar. So those are no-bake cookies. Uh, I've had those before, they're great. 
Yes, we're talking about cookies. Tates is just too good. Yes. Pot of coffee, whole package of Tates. <laughs> LOL. Yes. Yeah. I could put away a Tates bag very quickly. I don't know what divinity is. Do you, what is divinity? Oh, yeah. Pepperidge Farm Milanos fall into the sandwich cookie category for sure. How do y'all feel about eating cookie dough? I don't. I don't think I'm into it because it has raw egg in it. And there is a New York shop that opened recently that um, they sell uh, no egg cookie dough to snack on. I don't really. Mm, I'm not a fan of eating cookie dough. What about you? Earlier we talked about um, pickles. Now we're talking about cookies. What is everybody else's favorite cookie? So Tate's, Milano, cookie dough ice cream. I agree. I do like it. That actually was my order at, um, what's it called? What is that ice cream place called where they, uh, they mix it on the, the cold surface? Stone, not stone cold. I'm thinking of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Cold Stone Creamery. <laughs> Cold stones. Yeah, I would get the cookie dough with brownie and a banana. I know. I, you know, st stone cold ice cream. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ridiculous. Okay. So, that is all I have about cookies, friends. Does anyone have any questions about them? Or your favorite cookie? I'd love to hear more about your favorite cookies or, you know, a cookie that you got once. I've gotten a cookie um, as big as my head. You're in the minority of liking the holiday frosted cookies. I like them. I just think that they're too much work. Uh, what do I like? I think gingerbread is really high maintenance. I, I kind of don't like the dough. <laughs> Ooh, Pizuki. Yeah, we talked about Pizuki earlier. What's what's the restaurant that sells Pizuki? Like, where did that come from? Do you know? I don't remember. Where does Pizuki come from? Oh, BJ's. Right. Okay, yeah, there is a BJ's by my parents' house. Yep. Yeah, my mom will order a chicken sandwich and order a Pizuki up front. Like, she'll want the bazooki before she gets everything else. <laughs> it's very funny. Oh, mom. My mom has a sweet tooth. It's very cute. Um, okay, friends, let's get to that mental exercise time. Let's pretend we're on Chopped. Uh, name, like, let's name some, like, two or three ingredients, and then we'll mash them up together today. Uh... I think all of you have definitely done this with me before, so I don't feel like I have to explain it, but for people who are watching the stream later, um, for those of you catching up on YouTube, um, this part of the program is about expanding our minds and exploring the possibility of ingredients. So we name uh, a couple random ingredients in the chat, and then we work together to mash them up and see if they, how they can work together, if they can at all. Oh, gorgonzola cheese. Yes, an Italian cheese. That's the first one we've got here. Oh, I forgot to show you. Um, so while you're naming um, some ingredients in the chat, I want to show you what I got from the Asian market this week. I got um, wood ear mushroom. I'll change my screen, actually. Let me get to the bigger screen. Wood ear mushroom. It's, it says black fungus, but it's technically called wood ear. You soak it in hot water to reconstitute it, and then you add it to like noodle dishes and soups. It's very exciting. Um, an Australian chef friend of mine named Shinyi uh, gave me a recipe for pickled wood ear mushrooms, so I might pickle these uh, later on. And then I've been snacking on these. You might have heard me crunching earlier. Um, Garlic flavor broad bean, or this package says horse bean. I've never heard it called a horse bean before. Um, I love snacking on broad beans. I'll show you what it looks like. This is... 
it's really good, but the it has the pretzel factor. You know what I'm talking about? Like if you eat too many pretzels, <laughs> you start to choke a little bit and like get the hiccups. Um, so these broad beans are definitely really starchy and like clog up my throat easily. So um, if I'm not paying attention, I'll get like, ow. <laughs> Don't eat broad beans too fast. Okay, friends, we've got gorgonzola cheese to work with. We need like two more ingredients so we can pretend we're on chopped. What's a musk melon? What the heck is a musk melon? I've never had that before. What's a musk melon? Like a cantaloupe? Is it just smaller? Okay. We need one more ingredient. Fitzmurphy, you got something for us? Sorry, I'm speaking with my mouth full. Sorry, everybody. Okay. So, so far we've got gorgonzola and a musk melon. Welcome to one more ingredient, but so far, let's talk about gorgonzola cheese. It's a Italian blue cheese. It's sold in um, two different versions. So there's gorgonzola dolce, which is sweet and soft, and gorgonzola picante, which is a little bit more spicy, or um, it's got a little bit more of the aggressive blue mold, and it's a little firmer than uh, the gorgonzola dolce. Um, it functions like pretty much any um, blue cheese situation. So it goes really well with spicy stuff, goes really well with pickles. It's excellent with chocolate, actually. Chocolate covered cherries, specifically. I really, really love a dried cherry and blue cheese. It's my one of my favorite combinations ever. It can blue cheese can be served, um, you know, raw, like cut from the wheel. It can be heated up with some heavy cream to make a sauce. It can be uh, crumbled up for a salad. It can be stuffed inside things. Um, I've never had a musk melon, but if you say it's like a cantaloupe, then cantaloupe can be uh, cut into wedges. That's kind of the most traditional way we've eaten it, you know, uh, like a watermelon eating wedges. Um, you can cube it. You can shave it with a fruit peeler to make something of a ceviche or like, um, you know, like a, a cantaloupe noodle, like a melon noodle. You can shave it and have a shaved ice with it. Uh, I actually have a cantaloupe, um, cantaloupe ice in my freezer right now. So gorgonzola and musk melon sound like they already, on a cheese plate, would just taste good together. Um, but we could also make a gorgonzola like sauce and, um, could take the musk melon juice, ooh, and freeze it. Yum. I wonder if you could do a cocktail. Dairy and dairy in a fruit cocktail doesn't really sound that great. <laughs> Third ingredient, caviar. Interesting. What if we made a bowl out of the half of cantaloupe, put the caviar in the middle, and then I had like very light gorgonzola, like, dots of sauce around it. <laughs> Just shave a little bit of the gorgonzola, because gorgonzola is, like, so strong. Ooh, grilled melon with the shredded cheese. A plus. That sounds delicious. I am a fan of grilled fruit. Huge fan of grilled fruit. Um, caviar is tough because... The reason why it's so expensive is because, like, that caviar texture, you know, it's very luxurious. But I have a friend who makes um, a sea urchin mayonnaise. So you could do, like, a caviar mayonnaise or a caviar cream cheese to go with the uh, musk melon and a sandwich. <gasps> oh, interesting. So we can make a gorgonzola and cream cheese base 
um, fold in some caviar and have like a tartine, like a, like a nice sweet bread, like a brioche with like a gorgonzola whip, a little bit of caviar and some of that shaved cantaloupe on top. You could use low grade salad bar caviar. Who eats salad bar caviar? <laughs> I've never seen caviar at a salad bar. What kind of salad bar are you going to? That's hilarious. When you were a kid, you loved it. Interesting. I did not love caviar when I was little. Um, I've had caviar on top of a ramen. I've had caviar on a bagel. Hi, Lucius. How would you mix up caviar, melon, and gorgonzola cheese. Hmm. Try to think. How would you eat a hot thing? I feel like all three of those things benefit from being cold. Oh, no worries. Glad you're here now. Hmm. I kind of want to eat gorgonzola with caviar. I mean, the problem with gorgonzola is that it's very strong. And caviar is very delicate, and so is the melon. The melon's very delicate. And I think the, the solution here would be to mellow out the gorgonzola somehow. So maybe whipping it with some creme fraiche to cut it down, um, adding some lemon zest, um, and honey, actually. Honey and gorgonzola is a classic combination in cheese pairing. So adding sweet things to to a very salty thing is, you know, how we balance. Tobiko on a melon maki sushi. Whoa! Blowing my mind, sir. Wow, okay, so not thinking about fancy caviar, we're thinking about Tobiko, which is like the sushi orange fish eggs. That sounds awesome! I should have I should have thought of that because I, I made sushi this week. Ridiculous. That sounds awesome. Wow, I'm gonna think about that one for a while. <laughs> Ooh, a sushi application. Um, it'd be delicious in a salad, like a gorgonzola salad. Uh, you know, with spicy, spicy arugula, like a rocket arugula. Like at Trader Joe's, they have a wasabi arugula. That just means the arugula was picked late and it's just extra spicy. Um, yeah, oh gosh, guys, that sounds so good. I wonder if you can make a melon terrine with the cheese. I wonder if the melon would be too wet. You just have to press it long enough, I guess. That's a great idea. Now you want sushi. Sorry. I know, watching this stream, you get everybody gets so hungry. I get hungry. Um... Hmm. How else do we enjoy melon? A fruit salad? Like a ceviche? You could do melon ice cream. True. One of my favorite ice cream bars is called Melona. It's from Korea. It's green. Melon sorbet. Oh. Melon sorbet with just a tiny touch of the gorgonzola. Yeah. Mmm. That sounds good. Melon salsa. There we go. I like that. What if we did like a gorgonzola quesadilla with melon salsa? Finish it with like a little tobiko? That sounds fun. Melon salsa sounds like a great thing to do. Like, I have a tomato, and I... Oh, I don't have any more melon. That's a great idea. Good job. Well, friends, I think that those are some great ideas. You're gonna get me thinking about melon salsa all weekend until I make it. <laughs> um, so, next time... So, today, I went really long about pickles and then cookies. But um, we already have a request for noodles and parsley next week. Is there another suggestion you guys want to get to? Is there something that you want to dive into next week? If you don't have an idea in the chat right now, um, you can always tweet it to me or DM me on Instagram. Happy to take your suggestions for things you want me to cover. 
Um, this was really fun, guys. Oh, pork? Pork is such a large subject. What about pork, specifically? I could just talk about, like, generally. But, you know, this might be another... Ooh, pork chops. Okay. Let's do that. Pork chops. I, I actually have the most recipes on my website for pork chops. I just published yesterday um one for kimchi pork chops if you go to www.rand which is I'll, I'll type it in here rand which is yeah um <laughs> it's all good you're never too late there's always an archive i do appreciate it when when y'all make the time to come see me live it's it's really fun to hang out with you in the chat and like hear from you because you're the only people i talk to all week <laughs> oh no yeah you missed me on, on sunday shoot well you're here now which is great i know that my stream is a little earlier for most people but um, I'm not competing with any other streams, which was nice. <laughs> <coughs> so, next time, next Wednesday, we will cover noodles, parsley, and pork chops. So, thank you for those suggestions. I'll do my research. Um, if you have any other cooking questions, please feel free to tweet at me at Randwitches. That's my username down here. Um, I'll be back also on Sunday at 12 p.m. to talk about zines. Um, I run out of put egg on it issues, so I'm gonna be delving further into my zine library. I have a pretty big zine library, so um, it's gonna be cool to to explore what else I have and revisit a lot of the publications that I've I've helped put together, which is fun. Uh, don't forget, I love this book, uh, Asian Pickles by Karen Solomon, um, and the Flavor Bible, which will help you come up with pairings and uh, Improvise Better at Home. So those are the two books I highly recommend this stream. Oh, hello. Welcome to the... <laughs> hello, Schmas. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. I'm sorry that I'm leaving. <laughs> well, friends, um, I hope you have a good rest of your Wednesday. If you have any, any cooking questions, feel free to tweet at me or follow me on Instagram to... Hit me up, okay? Uh, so have a great Wednesday. Have a good rest of your week. And I look forward to discussing noodles with you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.